it's my great pleasure to introduce Courtney Condor, who is going to follow up on that chemistry and reproducibility uh, kind of theme. Um, she's a, a very careful chemist that joined my group uh, just after it started. Uh, she got a bachelor at a small liberal arts school in Michigan called Albion College uh, in 2017 and did a brief stint in Zoetis as a industrial uh, veterinary um, med, med chem um, job before coming back to, uh, to grad school. So she actually started her graduate career in the lab of David Kreich, and this is where she got her excellent chemistry training. She started working on some pretty complex uh, trisaccharide antibiotics. When David moved to Georgia, Courtney decided to stay at Wayne State and uh, thank thankfully chose to join my lab. Um, she was probably enticed by the promise that we work mainly on monosaccharide sugars of Blicknac and Galnac and um, uh, Mannac. Uh, however, I, I was able to challenge her by having her make a bunch of phospho sugars, which adds a new dimension of complexity. So without further ado, uh, I'll let Courtney share her, her graduate work. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I will say that it is a different, it's definitely an interesting change going from aminoglycoside antibiotics to monosaccharides. And it's a change that I definitely welcome when it comes to synthesis. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about the research that I've done so far in the fail lab um, regarding photocontrolled metabolic labeling. And we wanna use these to probe cellular pathways. And so we know that oglycnacylation plays a pretty large role in disease. Um, depending on the levels of glucose and oglycnac in the system of the cell, um, you can have more or less oglycnacylation. Um, and when we have a lot of oglycnacylation, we can be led to a lot of different disease states, including diabetes, cancer, or neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Um, there are tools that can study these, um, but there's a very large gap in the knowledge regarding fast oglycnac events, which occurred from the very first pulse of nutrient at time zero to anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. Um, most oglycnac tools that we have access to and that have been kind of published in literature only observe a time frame of about four to 16 hours. And so there's a pretty big gap. And so we've asked ourselves what's happening on this time scale that we can't see and how can we access these events that are happening on this time scale that we can't see. And so we kind of turned to um, glycnac metabolic labeling, which has been pretty well established um, in the last several years. Um, our main compound of interest uh, with the tools that we want to look at is the 6 azidyl acetylated glycnac. Um, this sugar is very wonderful for what we're looking for specifically with oglycnacylation because it's very, very specific for intracellular oglycnacylation compared to other metabolic labeling uh, tools. It's, however, a bit slow with cellular incorporation, and I will touch on that in a moment. The other sugar that we could look at is peracylated glycnaz, where instead of the azide on the six position of the glycnac, we now have it coming off the acetyl group on the two position amine. Um, the, sh the slight downside for this sugar is that it labels both intracellular and some extracellular proteins. And so it's not as specific for oglycnacylation as 6 acetylglycnac is. However, it is a little bit faster with its cellular incorporation. Um, these metabolic labeling tools operate through the salvage pathway of the hexosamine biosynthetic pathway. And so what we see here is we have glucose being 6-phosphate that gets converted to glycnac 6-phosphate which then gets isomerized into the 1-phosphate converted to UDP glycnac and then put on two proteins. With the azide modified sugars, they can enter the pathway at different vary or at varying points. So if you have the azide at the six position, you can't put a phosphate there. And so that can only enter the pathway here to get 1-phosphorylated, which makes it quite a bit slower. Um, whereas the glycnaz has a six and the one positions free and so it just gets recognized as glycnac and can be taken up into the 6-phosphate and the 1-phosphate. So how can we take advantage of um, controlling our compounds to get the time frame that we would like while also assisting them in the sexosamine biosynthetic pathway to get incorporated faster? Um, there's been a lot of research done on photocages over the last several decades. One of the first um, that I found was NPE-ATP. And this was made by coupling just a caged phosphate 
to um, ADP. They had some solubility issues and some interesting methods of getting it to go into the cells. And so with more research, other groups have come out with ways of um, caging the ATP differently so it can be brought into the cell a bit easier um, with things like the bioremovable groups that get cleaved with an enzyme and then UV light can control the release of ATP to study the effects. Other examples of photocages in the literature are um, photocage DNA methyltransferase inhibitors. So this deoxycytidine variant has been photocaged with several different groups and was used for those sorts of studies. And um, cyclic AMP has also been photocaged and it was actually one of the first compounds aside from uh, caged ATP that was actually uncaged in living cells. And so looking at all these years of research with um, photo cages and how they've been incorporated into cells and the cellular processes, um, we thought that perhaps we could apply that to these uh, metabolic labeling tools that have already kind of been around in the literature. And so the first bit of this wheel kind of shows a previously established um, metabolic labeling tools control um, chemical biology handles that we have. And so it starts with the 6 glicnac goes down to uh, glicnaz and then galnaz, which is an even less um, specific metabolic labeling tool that we would look at much later. Um, what we want to do with these is make phosphate photocages attached at various positions of the sugar. And so for 6 glicnac, we would attach a phosphate at the one position with the photocage. And for glicnaz, we could try the 6 position. We would eventually like to apply these to just GlickNAC without the azide attached so we can study phenotypic effects. But for today, I'm just going to talk to you guys about the metabolic labeling tools that we're working to make um, more controllable. So our theory here is that we can release the GlickNAC kind of further along in the hexosamine biosynthetic pathway. So if we have this um, GlickNAC that has a phosphate photocage on it, the photocage is gonna make it inert and it's not going to allow the GlickNAC to get taken up by AGX1 converted to um, UDP glycnac or OGT to be put onto the proteins. And so what we can do here is um, we can get it in the cells. We can use uh, light to release the photocage, which then allows the uh, one phosphoglycnac to get taken up into the exosamine biosynthetic pathway and glycosylated onto proteins. And so our hope with this is that when we revisit this issue with uh, these slow compounds that we have for metabolic labeling, we want to make them faster. If we could install the phosphates, we can allow them to skip further ahead in the pathway. And so if we have an anomeric phosphate on the 6 azido, um, after it's been decaged, all it needs is to be converted to UDP glycnac prior to glycosylation onto proteins by OGT. Um, and that would speed up the process and perhaps allow us to gain entry to that window of time between time zero and say 30 minutes that we're really looking to, to probe. Um, the next fastest compound that we can use is the peracetylated or the um, 6 phosphoglycnaz, which is just one step behind um, the anomeric phosphate for the 6 azido compound. So we began synthesizing this. Um, the synthesis is daunting when you have not done phosphate chemistry, um, but it's actually quite simple. Uh, so we start with phosphorus trichloride with um, this diisopropylamine in Hunix base in THF at zero degrees Celsius to make this um, dichlorophosphorus here. And then um, after a quick reduction to make the NPE, we cool the reaction mixture down to 15 degrees Celsius, add our NPE and triethylamine, um, and let that stir to get this um, cage donor in about a 45% yield. Once we have our cage donor in hand, we can take the glycnac that we have made with the azide. So we start with just regular glycnac. We tosylate the sixth position using tosyl chloride and pyridine before adding acetic anhydride to get this peracetylated um, compound here. And then we can just do an SN2 reaction with sodium azide and DMF, gently heating at about 65 degrees to stick this azide here at the six position to give us the six azido peracetylated glycnac that we're quite familiar with. Um, if you subject this to conditions with um, hydrazine acetate and DMF, you can get this um, anomeric deprotected sugar in about a quantitative yield. So when you take your anomeric deprotected sugar 
you can couple it to the phosphate um, photo cage donor that you've made using a tetrazole. We choose to use 5-ethylthiol 1-H tetrazole in DCM at zero degrees Celsius. Um, once the coupling looks complete by TLC, we add or we cool down to minus 40 degrees Celsius, add MCPBA, and um, oxidize the phosphate to finish the reaction. And so after purification, generally get 45 to 50% yield on, on this. So once we have our sugar, it's important to think about how we're going to use it. So the Glicknac metabolic labeling generally is done by taking your sugar and incubating it with your cells. Um, with the peracetylated forms, um, we usually just incubate that overnight. Um, and then the next day we can take our cells, we can lyse them, which gives us a mixture of proteins that have our modified sugar attached and you know, just proteins that don't have any glycnac attached. And the way that we pick out which proteins we've affected is by running a click chemistry reaction with this Tamara alkyne. This is how I trick myself into thinking that this is really just organic chemistry. Um, by doing this reaction with cellular lysates. And so once I've got the Tamara tag on, I can um, analyze this by SDS page gel. And what we're really looking for is this nice fluorescent bands. Um, so once we see this really dark bands, when we've fluorescence imaged our gels, we can see that we have tagged our proteins and that we have tagged our, um, our azido sugar with the Tamara alkyne. So this gives us a really clear method of really just seeing if our sugar is working and seeing if we're affecting anything in the cell. And so how we can take our photocaged uh, glicnac and apply this is we pre-incubate for a little while. The 16 hours is a bit much because the cell uh, generally tends to hydrolyze the anomeric phosphate if it's been in there for too long. So for five hours, we let the compounds sit in the media with the cells about a minute or two prior to decaging. Um, we remove the phenol red media wash with PBS and add um, phenol red free media. Uh, the light pulse occurs in a light box for about 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, we can begin either putting our plates back into the incubator for the specified times or um, we can freeze them. And so how we kind of stop the, the cell from clicknacolating and doing all the things it wants to do with the sugar is by um, removing the media, washing, and then popping them in the minus 80. Um, and so at the various time points we want to test, we can just kind of stop the reaction. Um, the next day, I will come in and I'll do the lysis with the, with the workflow that I showed previously. And so when we first did this, we wanted to test a variety of time points, short and long. Um, and we saw this really awesome burst as soon as we had finished radiating. So at time zero, as I like to call it, this is after 10 minutes in the light box. Um, I removed the plate from the light box. I immediately remove the media, wash the cells, and I put them in the minus 80. So this is stopping everything right after we are done um, with the light box. But this also, this really weird phenomenon happened where after 15 minutes, there's just suddenly no labeling. And it kind of comes back after two hours. And so we looked at this and we saw this really, really awesome result. And we asked ourselves, what could be causing this? Why did the labeling drop? And then why did it come back? And there's this paper from the Walker lab that kind of discusses OGT and OGA levels and how they can cycle based on glick neck levels in the cell. And so what our theory with this is, is that um, here when we first add the glick neck and it's, it's in the light box for 10 minutes, we have the sudden burst that brings us all the way up to here with OGT levels. There's a sudden flux of glick neck and the cell makes more OGT to compensate for it. But then the cell recognizes there's too much glick neck on proteins and so it makes more OGA to compensate and so in the next 15 minutes or so, based on the results that we had seen, this suddenly drops. We have a lot of OGA and we don't have a lot of OGT and we have very low levels of oglycnaclated proteins. Based on the time points that we observed, it takes another hour and a half or so for those OGT levels to build back up. And because of the drop at about four hours again, we know that this kind of comes back down. At some point it must equilibrate. And so it's difficult for us with the time points that we had and the really long incubation time to have more time points in one day. A five hour pre-incubation first time point you can get to is really four or five hours. You can't really see any of the six or seven hours or anything beyond. Um, and so what we asked ourselves is, can we lower the pre-incubation time to save some time in the lab? And can we also lower the concentration to save some compound? 
And so the first thing that I tested was um, the pre-incubation time. So I pre-incubated the compound in the cells, the media, for one, two, three, and five hours. Five hours is when we saw that really nice result. We had a little bit of an issue with that wanting to hydrolyze. Um, and so this was another bonus to see, can we put this in here for less amount of time and see a little bit less hydrolysis? And so from this experiment, I determined that one or two hours would be sufficient for labeling um, without hydrolyzing any of our sugar. And so next I tested for concentration. We had been using 400 micromolar concentration. I just wanted to see if we could perhaps use less compound. And so from this experiment, it's a little hard to tell, um, but 300 micromolar seems like it will suffice, which saves us a little bit of compound. Um, and in the long run, saves you a lot of compound. Um, and so then we noticed that reproducibility was not exactly 100%. And so we're kind of wondering if solubility is playing a role in this. Often when I dissolve the compound in DMSO and add it to the media, it crashes out and it doesn't mix very well in solution. It can be chunky or it can be very well homogenized. Um, and so depending on that, we may be seeing different results. So the first thing that I thought to try was perhaps just increasing the percentage of DMSO. Um, we're only pre-incubating for an hour. And so increasing it by um, five-fold to 0.5% from 0.1%. Um, we also tested 1% and then we really pushed it with two and a half and 5%. Um, and so with the DMSO concentration of 0.5%, we kind of started seeing a difference that we wanted to see. Um, and again, I was still having some issues with reproduci reproducibility being consistent. Um, and so I, I scourged through the building to find any labs that had any cyclodextrin that we could try because it will help um, solubilize nonpolar compounds. And so I attempted to use the beta cyclodextrin and the poly beta cyclodextrin in an experiment to maybe try and help complex with the sugar to keep it in solution a bit longer um, so we could get the results that we're kind of looking for. Um, after some more reading, I noticed that beta cyclodextrin and poly beta cyclodextrin are not the best compounds for this choice. And I've recently gotten my hands on some other cyclodextrins that are um, a bit more soluble in media. So I, that's next on my to-do list. So in the meantime, we're thinking about how we can fix solubility while maintaining permeability. And so the Davis group had previously shown that you can have a photocaged um, trihalose 6-phosphate and it would still pass through um, with the help of some transporters. And so we're curious about if we can get this GlickNAC deacetylated with the free hydroxy groups to still pass through the cell membrane and be soluble in the media to kind of mitigate some of those issues we're having with the compound crashing out. So first I attempted to deacetylate this using some very mild conditions with sodium methoxide and methanol um, and that was hydrolyzing the compound and giving some mixed results. And so the next condition that I tried was actually done by Pratt and Bertozzi um, with a five to two to one ratio of methanol water to triethylamine. And that also seemed to very much enjoy cleaving my anomeric phosphate. And so now what I'm trying is um, a coupling on the free sugar. And so if we can tosylate this and make the free sugar and we can couple this, and hopefully it selectively goes to the anomeric position, um, we can run this azide displacement reaction to get the azide and have these two hydroxy groups free, which will hopefully help solubility without hindering permeability too much. And so the next compound that we're thinking of in the series is a six-cage glycnaz. Um, the synthesis for glycnaz is reported, so we start with um, chloroacetic and hydride and glucosamine with sodium methoxide, methanol, and triethylamine to get this chloroacetylated compound before displacing the chlorine with sodium azide in DMF uh, to get this azide modified um, glycnac. So in order to selectively free up the six position, I can selectively protect the six position with triple chloride and pyridine before peracetylating the remaining hydroxy groups. Um, and so here's where we're at with this right now. In the future, I plan to deprotect this triddle position selectively using a solution of 20% TFA in water before doing the same phosphate coupling on the six position um, to access the six photocage version of this compound. So my conclusions, we have access to 6 azido one phosphate photocage glycnac, um, but we're worried that solubility is leading to issues with reproducibility with this compound.
Um, after we are done optimizing this, we would like to move to just a 6-acetyl 1-phosphate that I mentioned before, um, photocage glicnac for doing phenotypic studies. And we're particularly interested in the NF-kappa B phenotypic assays. Um, and the next steps from here are the 6-phosphate photocage glicnas, which will be a bit less selective for glicnacylation, but it'll likely be more stable than the 1-phosphate photocage glicnac and a bit less prone to hydrolysis. Um, I would like to thank my lab, uh, particularly Dr. Fail for taking me in when I didn't have a home. Um, former members, uh, my committee members, I would like to thank some of the members at Kreitch Lab for teaching me all the things that I know about sugar synthesis, um, Wayne State for giving me a Rumble Research Fellowship, and Glyconet and ACS Carbohydrate Division for the invitation to talk today. Um, and I'll take any questions that you guys have.